Pushkin. Hello, podcast fans. Malcolm Gladwell here. I'm the host of Revisionist History and co-founder of Pushkin Industries. Pushkin is home to Revisionist History and other great shows like The Happiness Lab, Against the Rules, Cautionary Tales, Broken Record, and A Slight Change of Plans. Join Pushkin Plus and you'll hear all our shows ad-free and get access to exclusive bonus content. Pushkin Plus is just $4.99 a month, which is nothing, or $39.99 a year. Subscribe now in Pushkin Podcasts or at pushkin.fm. There's a ton of great personal finance and early retirement stuff out there, but how do you find the most impactful content? Well, Optimal Finance Daily is where financial independence enthusiasts listen daily to narrated content from the world's best writers. The host finds brilliant content for you every day of the year and helps you find tactics and techniques to improve your life in just a few minutes. You'll hear different perspectives and strategies for saving and making more that you won't find anywhere else. In every episode, Optimal Finance Daily invites you to take a mindful moment from your daily life and dive into an enlightening audio experience. So if you're looking to improve your life, And here are some words of wisdom covering investing, saving, and earning more. Check out the Optimal Finance Daily Podcast. Start or end your day on the right foot. Learn more at oldpodcast.com. And listen to Optimal Finance Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Here's the original contract for Liar's Poker, January 88. And the title on the contract was Fast and Loose in the Golden Years. If you can believe that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, that's right. <laughs> All right, here is an information sheet that they wrote when they were trying to figure out what it was. Mm-hmm. This can accurately be described as a nonfiction bonfire of the vanities. And Michael Lewis himself was nothing other than a master of the universe. The term actually used on the Solomon trading floor is big swinging dick. Lewis describes from the inside his rake's progress through the fabulous palace of greed, ambition, and folly that was Solomon Brothers in the 1980s. This is a born storyteller. Blah, blah, blah. A storytelling asset. Yeah, how about that? (laughs) A storytelling asset who, for the rest of his career, will be known mainly as the guy who coined the phrase big swinging dick, which I didn't even do. But there was some truth in that phrase because at Solomon Brothers, anatomy was destiny. The sexism there was from another age. Even at the time, it shocked me. I mean, for example, it was fairly common for strippers to turn up on the trading floor and get up on one of the guy's desks and take off all their clothes. And no one thought that was weird. They thought it was just like, what happens on a trading floor? But that kind of stuff maybe wasn't as important as the message that women got. The message that they were, in the end, not all that valuable. Bonds, bonds, and more bonds. Anyone who did not want to trade them for a living wanted to sell them. This group now included several women who had initially hoped to trade. At Solomon Brothers, men traded. Women sold. No one ever questioned the Solomon ordering of the sexes. But the immediate consequence of the prohibition of women in trading was clear to all. It kept women farther from power. It turns out that one of my mentors at Solomon Brothers was a woman. She's who kind of plucked me from the training program and found me a place on the trading floor. Her name was Leslie Christian, and we had a kind of running conversation about what it was like for her in this guy's place. Her voice was somewhere in the back of my head when I was writing the book. How do you think Liar's Poker would have been different if I had been a woman? Oh, my gosh. She would have had, I can only speak for myself. I don't think it would have been as, I don't, I'm not saying it was easy for you to write the book. I don't think I could have been that balanced. And I, what I mean is you, there's an element of, or a a flavor of, you're, you know, you're sort of in it, you're kind of in there, you're in it, but not of it. And it's kind of funny and it's kind of shocking. I think women um, feel it deeper. There were times when I was 
sobbing. There was a time I went to a lawyer and said, can I do something about this? You know, I, I was treated poorly. I wasn't treated poorly like harassment or anything. I wasn't, I didn't get an assignment I wanted. And and then that constantly having to be on alert to be professional and to be taken seriously. I don't think, I could not have written that book. No way. I didn't have that same, I didn't have the same exposure either. I mean, I think guys talk differently when they're not around women. So you felt left out of some of the conversation. Oh, sure. I know I was left out. I mean, i that's one of my, the things I, I laugh about now is I really had no idea they were arranging prostitutes for clients or buying drugs for clients. I really, I had, that was completely off my radar. So in a funny way, the firm was less visible to you than it was to me. You think a woman wouldn't have had the visibility into the firm. That's right. Yeah. Leslie actually left Solomon Brothers around the time I did. She's now a senior investment advisor at something called North Star Asset Management, which is a firm that does socially responsible investing. I guess we'd both like to think that things had gotten better for women on Wall Street since the 1980s. And, you know, obviously from a distance, it looks like they have. But in this episode, we're going to ask, have they actually gotten better? I'm Michael Lewis, and welcome back to Other People's Money, a companion podcast to Liar's Poker. This is episode three, Fast and Loose in the Golden Years. I find myself still wanting to know what Wall Street looks like through the eyes of a woman, not just back then when I was there, but now. So I called up a woman named Ann Clark Wolf. She's had an incredibly successful run on Wall Street. She became the chairman of Bank of America's Corporate and Investment Banking Division. American Banker has called her one of the most powerful women to watch on Wall Street. And just recently, she announced that she was leaving big banks to start her own investment bank, which she calls Independence Point Advisors, and has said that it will be made up of at least 70% women and people of color, which is to say no more than 30% white men. And the firm already has a nickname. How did you get the nickname Solomon Sisters? I just loved the pun of Solomon Sisters versus Solomon Brothers. One reason she loves the pun is that she actually was in the training program of Solomon Brothers three years after me. Her experience of that was different in one important way. She was reading Liar's Poker. I read it in the training program at Solomon Brothers, one mimeographed page at a time. (laughs) So when we started in the training program in August of 89, and we were the class who was hired after the crash of 87, so we were a very small class, but literally a page of your book would work its way down the aisle every day. So the book came out in October of 89. So you would- It must have been the tail end of that. It must have been the tail end of your training class. And so was it a mimeograph from from the actual book? I don't know whether someone got their hands on it or whether it, it would just look like photocopied pages to me, but I distinctly remember reading it that way, which is a pretty, you know, disconnected way to read a book. So that's why I enjoyed actually going back and reading it like a real book. But it it shows you how it really resonated with people and was clearly part of the culture. Well, one of the reasons I suspect you were reading a mimeograph copy is John Goodfriend told the whole firm that they weren't allowed to buy it. Uh, so that if you wanted to read it, cop, photocopy it. So the training program... I do remember. I remember that now that you say that. And do you... I mean, since we're on this, um, yep. what did you make of it at the time? So, it, so it's interesting at the time. I think it was a, it was a celebration of some of the great qualities of Solomon, and I think it was also clear that there were some elements that were probably slight exaggerations, just to make the characters more interesting. Do you think the people sitting in the tr- your training class passing mimeographed pages of liars poker to each other? Would have rec- did they recognize the training class I described? Oh, like- totally, totally. The training class descriptions were incredibly accurate. The back row set the tone of the class because the back row acted throughout as one indivisible, incredibly noisy unit. 
the back row people moved in herds for safety and for comfort, from the training class in the morning and early afternoon, to the trading floor at the end of the day, to the surf club at night, and back to the training program the next morning. They were united by their likes as well as their dislikes. They rewarded the speakers of whom they approved by standing and doing the wave across the back of the class. And they approved wholeheartedly of the man at the front of the room now. The speaker paused as if lost in thought, which was unlikely. You know, he finally said, you think you're hot shit, but when you start out on the trading floor, you're going to be at the bottom. The notion, again, of who sat in the front row, who sat in the back row, it's actually kind of stunning when I reread it to think that, and it wasn't like it was set up that way. It wasn't like when you walked in the first day, somebody said, you folks, you sit there because you fit the stereotype. But it's just, that seemed to just have a life of its own that that perpetuated itself. Where did you sit? Middle. (laughs) Middle. (laughs) I was neither. So back up for me a little bit and just tell me how you ended up applying for Wall Street jobs in the first place. Like, how did you get the bug to work on Wall Street? I I had been an economics and English major in undergrad. I liked the intersection of writing and data. And what I loved was that Wall Street was a way to experience what you were reading about on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. It somehow brought deals and the news to life in a way that you were getting a front row seat of how those transactions came together. And I still think that that's, frankly, what captivates me still today, 32 years later. It's an amazing opportunity to work with companies at an interesting moment in time on something that is a really big deal to them. And when you, so you you were hired by Solomon Brothers, you were hired into the investment banking department. And I'm curious, like, what it felt like then to be a woman coming into this place. I had lots of women friends who would fill my ears with what had happened to them. But um, but I'm curious, like, what your experience was? I had a phenomenal experience because the men who I worked with and for treated me like I was one of the guys, and I never felt a gender difference in my case. Part of that was I was virtually married by the time I started at Solomon, so I was probably not the most interesting prospect of the of the women in my class. But I think as we, a number of us are still close friends, and we've actually had reunions of our class over the years. And the women have all agreed that they felt like it was a very equal opportunity place. Ultimately, the men just wanted who were the best and the brightest, and did you help them get the job done? Part of why I'm building what I'm building today is I think it's actually far worse today than it was in 1990. Because in 1990, it truly was just about capitalism. And uh, it was a young person's business. And if the men who I worked with and for saw that I had anything to add to a deal team or that I had a talent, they were all in. So if you'd have told me that the woman who was going to create a women-centric <laughs> investment bank in 2021 was going to come along with the narrative that Solomon Brothers in 1989 was a kind of golden age compared to now. You would not have <laughs> for, expected for, that, would for, you? For Solomon Brothers, in, for a golden age for women. I, I'd have said, I, I, my head would be spinning. I, like, like, how? So I want to talk a little bit about what, why you think it might have been better for women in Solomon Brothers in 1989 than it is for women now in a big Wall Street bank? I think for women in particular, there were a couple of themes. I noticed the first outflow of women in the mid-90s. So as the private equity industry and the hedge fund industry started to take off, candidly, a lot of women who had married or were dating men in those industries just said it was no longer worth the the aggravation. The aggravation of dating them or the aggravation of going to work? The aggravation of trying to be a working spouse with them when, you know, when your partner frankly had an incredible amount of money or an incredible amount of upside in their role. So there was definitely a decision by a generation of women to uh, to decide to stay at home, which again very admirable that they they were they were willing to do it and able to do it. But it basically left a huge hole generationally. Uh, and people who were 
kind of poised to be ready than than when the street took off. God, that's interesting. So there's like a generation of women who were put out of business basically by more successful men in the same business. People want to believe that women exit because the job has long hours or is difficult. When you interview women, they never say that. They, in fact, say, I can respect the fact that it's difficult. They leave because of the lack of inclusion. So at the end of the day, some of what I describe as the camaraderie and the inclusion that happened at Solomon, where you were part of the team, you were part of the family, women were included in the NCAA pool at Solomon. You know, that was like an incredible, fun rallying moment where people would trade shares on different teams in the NCAA. Um, So once you lost that camaraderie and what pulled people together, I think it was ultimately the inclusion led a number of people to say that they kind of checked out. And, And they, and interestingly, almost all continue to work. They just worked in a different capacity, whether they went in-house or whether they they went on to different variations of the field. So why were women excluded? If Solomon Brothers was a go- kind of golden age of including women in things, and I would actually kind of dispute that on the trading floor, <laughs> but I know what you're saying. It was so kind of rough and tumble, and then if you were good at your job, it's sort of, and you were willing to maybe ignore this comment or that comment, you moved up in the firm. Well, and, and by the way, I was six months pregnant when I made Uh managing director at Solomon. So maybe people thought it was cute to have this large pregnant woman in the picture with Derek Maughan and others when they promoted me. But I thought that that was an interesting moment that where everybody would have stereotypically said, of course, you could never get promoted when you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. I think that they enjoyed the fact that they were able to prove that wrong. But describe for me the exclusion that happens. After Solomon Brothers, I mean, as time moves on, you're saying you, you kind of see women having a harder time being included. How does it, what form does the exclusion take? I'd love to be able to put a pin in exactly what it is. But, you know, I think the other variable I would call out is in 1990, even in investment banking at Solomon, I would guess probably at least 40% of the men had working spouses. That was not true. Um, and certainly in my last two big jobs. And if you if you have a working spouse, or increasingly, if you have a working daughter, I think it completely changes the mindset. The number of times in the past five to ten years where I see a man proudly say, "I'm sponsoring her. I have her back. I'm not going to put up with." somebody cutting her out of a deal or taking a key account away from her, that has gone to the wayside. I mean, I could name for you four or five men at Solomon who all thought that they had the fingerprints on my success and all did have their fingerprints on my success. I couldn't name five people now who are as deliberate in viewing it as their role in really helping women continue to thrive and get those opportunities, get the most important accounts, get put on the most important deals. You know, it's interesting, the point you made about how you, you, you can't really look, you look across the street and you can't really see very many examples of the kind of men who had their fingerprints on your career at Solomon Brothers, that there isn't that kind of personal relationship between senior men and younger women. And I'm wondering if part of the problem is that we're in a culture where those relationships are are more dangerous. It's a huge issue. I think, listen, I think the, whether it's real or implied, I mean, I have had a number of people cite the Pence rule. That amazes me. I didn't even know there was a Pence rule, except he had that weird rule himself. People refer to it openly and commonly as, as a very clear indicator of feeling like either that they can't be in um, certain settings with women on their team or certainly would never, would be very uncomfortable. You would not have dinner alone with a woman on your team, which again, I just, I would not have thought twice about it myself. And you think about where the great um, mentoring often happens or where the war stories happen or where you really feel like you develop that trust with somebody who you can ask all of those questions, 
it typically does happen either when you're flying somewhere together or you're having dinner with somebody or in those other social settings. The, the conditions where a woman, a young woman would build a professional relationship with an older, important man happen to be the same conditions where the older man might suggest an inappropriate relationship. And so you've got this problem where the older man doesn't want to be in a position where he might be accused of having having suggested an inappropriate relationship. But part of me wonders if what's going on is all of this is being used as an excuse. That's sort of like men now have an excuse not to make much effort with women. I think you're spot on, by the way. I would also argue that the more that diversity became the purview of HR and DEI executives and other people's jobs, it became incredibly convenient for the men to opt out. You know, they would be forced to sit through the diversity training and they would they would do the other check the box exercises, but it became really somebody else's job. And not a high paying or high status job. No. Well, I have to tell you, one of my favorite Solomon bosses, who's now the CEO of a company, uh, we were talking about how he resisted the pressure to hire a DEI officer. And he said, I'm the DEI officer. And I said, damn it, you're right. And the problem is we need more CEOs to think they really are the DEI officers. It's a funny way of dealing with the marginalized population is to marginalize the whole subject. The role. Yeah. Right. We're going to take a break here. Other People's Money will be right back. More than 2 million young professionals read The Hustle's daily email for its informative take on the latest happenings in the business and tech industry. Now they're bringing their irreverent tone to the airwaves with a new podcast called The Hustle Daily. Every weekday, they share what you need to know about the biggest business headlines and why you should care about them. Recently, they've talked about how major companies like Google and Disney are facing labor issues and what making daylight saving time permanent would mean for the economy. Make sure you tune in on Wednesdays, where they go deep on one idea, trend, or industry, like the economics of doomsday preppers, or the story behind the world's most popular Airbnb listing. There really is something here for everyone, so take a quick second to search for The Hustle Daily Show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You won't regret it. I want to tell you about another podcast that tackles the big questions of the future. It's called Exponential View from the Harvard Business Review. It's hosted by Azim Azar, a serial entrepreneur, technologist, and investor. As a practitioner, Azim explores how societies are changing under the force of exponential technologies like AI, synthetic biology, renewable energy, and others. On Exponential View, Azim speaks with CEOs, policymakers, scientists, and the world's leaders about these new technologies. They tackle questions like, how will we live morally in the metaverse? And how will quantum computing change the way you do business? Find out why Daniel Ek, founder and CEO of Spotify, calls Azeem one of the most highly regarded thought leaders in the industry. Check out Azeem Azar's Exponential View wherever you get your podcasts. I'm back with investment banker Ann Clark Wolf. I want to get dig into the motives of, and also I want you to explain the business you've created that's now been, got the nickname Solomon Sisters. What, what is this business? Well, and I was very clear to not name it Solomon Sisters. It was really, <laughs> it was really a running joke as I was reaching out to friends and people who I trusted and thinking about what, where I could still have an impact on the industry. And I took the view that I had 32 years across the three biggest firms between Solomon up through Citigroup for 20 years, two years at JP Morgan, and then almost 10 years at Bank of America, that despite where I felt like I had put a lot of effort in pulling through diverse candidates, I still looked around and I said that I thought that I was leaving the industry with a different composition and complexion than I would have hoped. And I do believe in the power of cognitive diversity, that if you can combine a bunch of different minds, different histories, different backgrounds, I actually do believe it leads to better advice. So the, the premise was diverse people 
had to be exceptional to survive on Wall Street. They probably didn't get the best clients to cover or the easiest tasks or opportunities. So if I can curate a group of those exceptional people who just happen to be diverse and not lead with diversity, can I change the client experience? You know, the industry certainly would say that the numbers are different than what I'm representing at a macro, but a lot of that progress has not really translated per se into investment banking. And and there's actually been research that shows, good academic research that shows that women running E-Trade accounts manage them more sensibly than men running E-Trade accounts. And there's no research on the other side saying actually men are better at this. So it is very peculiar that given that we're supposed to be, you know, an efficient free market economy and Wall Street's supposed to be like a meritocracy, that there hasn't been a drive to actually replace the men with the women because the women might actually naturally be better suited to it. I like to bring it back to the ski industry because I love skiing. And so when people show up at a ski resort and they need to be put into their ski class, women will say on a scale of one to 10, there are four. The man will say that he's an eight and they're both sixes. Um, And so I think, uh, and that story has also played out in job qualifications. And I I think an interesting modern word for it, and, and I still experience this, I have probably four hours a day of imposter syndrome. The data is super clear, though. I mean, it's, you know, you can find the data on qualifications for jobs uh, between men and women. So it's, I do think that if you take that data, it makes me hopeful that as I build a firm and you have women and minorities with that mindset of always having been the underdog and always erring on the side of underrepresenting what their capabilities are, I hope that that's exactly the kind of advice a CEO would want. Do you think that part of the problem is that people who are delegating the the risk-taking decisions, the ultimate holders of capital, who are giving their money to a hedge fund or a private equity fund or or buying shares in Goldman Sachs so they can trade, whatever it is, that those people are deceived by confidence, that in fact the best way to get a hold of other people's money to whip it and drive it and swing it around in the markets is to pretend that you know a lot more than you do and that the problem is ultimately that – the holders of capital are bad judges of who's good at managing the capital? I I don't know how you're ever going to undo the natural gravitational force that tends to reward people who may be confident at the expense of being capable. Right. I mean, one way of viewing it, and one way everybody will view it, is is, uh, the role of women in finance is as a massive social injustice. But there's another way of viewing it is like a massive market inefficiency. Like the money is being invested stupider because women are not equally involved in the investment decisions. And you, you put it like that, and the reply might come from the opposition that, Oh, there's no way the markets would allow that kind of, any market would allow that kind of inefficiency. But like, that's not true. Look at the CEO of Carlisle has recently said that the cost of capital that they allocate to their portfolio companies that have diverse teams and a diverse board is different. Their financial results were 12% better with their diverse portfolio teams. Diversity pays. Diversity pays. And eliminating mail over confidence. Yes. Pays too. So given all of that, you candidly wonder why we haven't seen more progress since even if people just put their capitalist hat on, they'd be making more money. But at the end of the day, until until a head trader is told he will make $500,000 more if he has a, a woman a black man, a Latin X, an LBGTQ leader in his ranks, and he will lose 500,000 if that person leaves because they weren't ultimately feeling supported. You just don't have the incentives that have really met people at the place where they really understand the most, which is which is ultimately around around capitalism. They all know and feel bad about the lack of representation in sales and trading, but feeling bad just hasn't translated into 
the day in day out behavior that's just going to be key to really making it attractive and interesting and compelling for a woman to want to be in that seat. I want to thank Ann Clark Wolf for trying to figure out what's going on with women on Wall Street and trying to tell us how it really is. And go check out our firm Solomon Sisters, I mean Independence Point, if you're so inclined. Other People's Money is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review. If you don't like it, don't say anything. You can buy our new Liar's Poker audiobook, unabridged and read by me, the author, at pushkin.fm slash liarspoker, and also at Audible. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Coming up in the next episode, what it's like to re-encounter your earlier work. I mean, it's funny listening back, it really sheds a lot of light on conversations that I had with my parents. They were hearing the work I was doing and telling me that I should go to medical school. And I remember <laughs> at the time feeling like, well, you are very not supportive of my dream, you know? And But now like <laughs> listening back, I realized like, oh wait, no, they just heard the evidence in front of their ears of like, oh, this isn't good. Like this isn't good what you're making. Ira Glass and I try to make sense of our earlier selves and the work we created. I guess I have been wondering, did you ever play Liar's Poker or see people play? That's a good question. I did not play Liar's Poker. I am about the worst gambler on the face of the planet. And I certainly would not have had John Merriweather's poker face to pull off a game of Liar's Poker. You just did a very female thing, right? You That's just said, true. You just That's said, true. The, the guys don't say I'm the worst gambler on the on the face of Wall Street guys don't anyway. They but that's all, also, they, but they that's all also why w- women wouldn't play liar's poker and lose a lot of money either, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right.